his education. We need to teach about what Jews have contributed to the quality of lives for everyone, even those who hate us. Since there are many groups that have months to educate about their country, of well, Florida, I decided that I would try to get a Florida Jewish History Month to focus on the Jewish contributions here in the Sunshine State and celebrate the strength and richness that a multicultural population brings to our state. Florida has the nation's third largest Jewish community. About 15% of the American Jewish community lives here. And so, and, and the first settlement in all of America was in St. Augustine, right here in Florida. There were probably conversos in St. Augustine in the 16th century, but that's a, another lecture. So I worked, trying to get my slide to move. Did my slide move? You have to do the, share your screen. Oh, I forgot to do that. <laughs> no, oh, she, no, she's, her screen's on. I guess oh, it is. Okay. Yeah, she's on. She just has to hit the down arrow or the slide. There it goes. Okay. Oh. Okay. So I work closely with Senator, State Senator Gwen Margolis and our State Representative Gus Guerrero to make Florida Jewish History Month happen. Brazilian-born artist Romero Brito designed our colorful logo. And in 2003, Governor Jeb Bush signed that legislation. This was and might still be the nation's first statewide Jewish History Month. We prepared educational materials and press packets for schools, municipalities, and organizations all around the state. In the process, I thought it made sense to align the month with the National Month for Jews and was astounded to find out there was no National Month. Everyone had a month except the Jews, the Asian Pacific Americans, the Blacks, the Irish, the Italians, the women, Hispanics, Indians, gays and lesbians, deaf, elderly, disabled, every kind of group you can think of had a month. Amazing, no, that the Jews didn't have a month after all that we have contributed. So after researching how these groups existed, I created a mission statement, strategic plan and goals for an American Jewish Heritage Month. All this took considerable thought and time while I was, of course, running the Jewish Museum of Florida. The name American Jewish Hist History Month was important because we are Jewish no matter where we live, and American is the adjective. I'll come back to that in a moment. I'm trying to get the next slide. The mission statement, which you can read, to reach the broadest possible cross-section of our country to celebrate and teach the contributions of American Jews who have enriched the quality of life for all Americans and help weave the fabric of our nation's history, culture, and society. So the first step was where to start. On January the 11th of 2004, at the Jewish Museum of Florida, we had our first observance of Florida Jewish History Month. Proclamations were received from municipalities throughout our 67 counties. We had a great crowd. Everyone wanted to be seen supporting the Florida Jewish History Month. My remarks included this statement. This is a critical time in Jewish history. Anti-Semitism based on old prejudices and slander is growing around the world, on college campuses and in our communities. Does this sound familiar? State Representative Kendrick Meek of Miami, who was shown here in the red circle, attended, and I spoke to him about introducing federal legislation establishing an American Jewish History Month. Jody Bach Davidson of Representative Meek's staff pursued the possibility, but then she left to join the staff of Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz when she was elected later that year. So I refocused my plan. Debbie Wasserman Schultz was the first Florida Jewish woman elected to Congress, and for that, we were honoring her in 2005 at our Jewish Museum of Florida annual glass ceiling event. I asked Debbie, it's a very historic day, April the 10th, 2005, when she was at the museum for the glass ceiling event, if she would sponsor such legislation. 
President George Bush had declared a moratorium on any more months, and it was a Republican Congress. Debbie lit up when I asked her and responded most enthusiastically, and I remember her exact words. Yes, even as a Democrat, I think I can make this happen. And she did. While she was lobbying her congressional colleagues, I partnered with Judy Gilbert Gould, who was the CRC director of the Greater Miami Jewish Federation, to write the legislation. And then we had a massive national advocacy effort of both parties aimed at the entire Congress and President Bush. By June the 8th of 2005, keep in mind this is really fast. I mean, I just, I, I can't think of any other legislation or any other action by Congress that moved like this did. And that's really attributed to Debbie. Uh, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Representative Henry Hyde of Illinois asked other members of the House to become sponsors of the legislation and agreed to waive the rules of the House and allow consideration of a resolution to create a special month. Remember, this was a moratorium, so this, was, this process was necessary to open up the moratorium that President Bush had established. Debbie was busy running around the hill with her clipboard, and 250 House members signed on. Amazing. During these months, Judy and I were very busy with our national lobbying efforts with constituents to send emails and or call President Bush to urge his signing of the legislation. On December the 15th, again, keep in mind, this is just rocket speed, the U.S. House of Representatives passed by a vote of 423 to zero, 423 to zero, unanimous, the resolution urging President George W. Bush to proclaim each January as American Jewish History Month. I had asked for January, but when Arlen, Senator Arlen Specter agreed to lead the effort in the Senate, he said people in his state of Pennsylvania would not come out for events in the winter. So he wanted to change it to May. That's how it became May. During this time, Representative Wasserman Schultz was working with House Speaker Dennis Hastert to urge President Bush to establish by executive order an annual American Jewish History Month. On February the 14th, 2006, just two months later, led by Senator Arlen Specter, the U.S. Senate passed by unanimous consent a resolution urging the president to, to proclaim a designated annual American Jewish History Month. On March 22nd of 2006, I received word that President George Bush planned to sign on April 20th the Proclamation for Jewish American Heritage Month designated for May. I said I would come back to the name. I immediately expressed concern that the month was to be called Jewish American Heritage Month instead of American Jewish History Month. I can't, and, and again, because we are Jews no matter where we live, the American is the adjective. So I wanted an American Jewish and not Jewish American. For those of you that know me, I'm very particular about details. And this was a national thing that was going to be forever, and I wanted to get it right. So I contacted Jay Seidman, who was President Bush's Jewish liaison to the White House, who said he would work to get this changed. I also contacted key Republicans to enlist their help on this matter. P.S. The name of the month, as you know, now remains at Jewish American Heritage Month. I did not get the name changed. So on April 24th of 2006, at the Jewish Museum of Florida, this was so major for us. This was historic. This was national. And it happened at our museum. We rolled out the month to honor the significant contributions that American Jews have made to our nation. U.S. Representative Dave, Debbie Wasserman Schultz and I spoke, reviewing how we'd gotten to that day. Other speakers were, as you see in your photograph from left to right, Jimmy Resnick, Greater Miami Jewish Federation President Michael Adler, and Stanley Tate. Their task was to speak directly to President Bush, because they all had his ear, and they did make that happen. 
on September 27th of 2006. Again, it's the same year. Keep in mind how condensed this is. This is like, you know, a year and a half from when I first thought of this. It's absolutely amazing. On September 27th of 2006, U.S. Representative Debbie Wasserman Schultz held a strategic planning meeting at the Library of Congress in Washington. It was such a, I don't know how many of you have been there. The place is so impressive and so gorgeous. And just to be in those surroundings was just very, very remarkable. So we had uh, a, a planning meeting with representatives of national organizations from all around the country, members of Congress and community leaders. Following that, we attempted a national membership campaign to focus community events throughout the nation. Annual Presidential Jewish American Heritage Month proclamations began, and when President Barack Obama was the president, he held White House receptions for three years, 2010, 2011, and 2012. It was glorious. We had, uh, this was the first uh, original task force when we met at the White House. Um, I, I got to go all three years. It was so phenomenal. We had, um, this is, uh, you can, oh, this is the first row of the, re, at the reception, and you can see there's Arlen Specter, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Joe Biden, Michelle Obama, the president, Sandy Koufax from the Baseball Hall of Fame, who happens to live in Florida. He was in our Florida sports exhibit, and Theodore Bacall. This was just one close uh, shot of the front row. Um, they had um, glot kosher food. It was the most amazing thing to be in the White House with glot kosher food, absolutely beautiful display. The military band was playing Jewish music. I mean, the whole thing, you just have to imagine the excitement of the, about a hundred of us there at this reception. And this, as I said, this went on for three years. Another major aspect that is so important to me Oh, there's some more of, of the, um, this was uh, Elliot, Elliot Stone, president of the Jewish Museum of Florida at that time in 2012, joined us at the White House. And then another major aspect of JM that is so memorable to me is the phone call I received from NASA th that the Jewish astronaut Garrett Reisman wanted to take something Jewish aboard the U.S. Space Shuttle Atlantis in May of 2010. He wanted to take something when he was going from South Florida to the International Space Station and back. A journey of almost 5 million miles with 186 orbits of the Earth. I suggested the original 2006 proclamation that George Bush had signed that created JAM. They agreed. And paperwork was signed, and we at the museum got very busy packaging this up and sending it to Houston to prepare it for a space journey. Then, in this picture, this is in August of 2010, I went to Philadelphia. Garrett Reisman had gone to space and come back, and he wanted to present the proclamation back to me. In the meantime, I had convinced our board that even though I was reluctant to let it go from our collection, I thought it was most important to get the most exposure for this proclamation and for the whole Jewish American Heritage Month. And at that time, that summer, the National Museum of American Jewish History was opening on the mall in Philadelphia, big new museum, the National Museum for American Jewish History. So I thought it was appropriate that we have that proclamation in their collection because it would get much more exposure. Our board, to their credit, agreed to do that. So on August the 10th of 2010, I flew to Philadelphia. Garrett Reisman met me, as you can see there, presented the proclamation back to me as representing the Jewish Museum of Florida, and I officially turned it over to the National Museum of American Jewish History for their collection, and that stands now in their collection. For the past 15 years, I have served on the board of JAM, and also there was an advisory council of representatives from organizations around the country. Together, we plan the annual themes, public relations, and the rollout of the month every year. This year, of course, is most challenging since there are no public programs due to the COVID-19. The National Museum of American Jewish History is in transition and partnered with a company called J Muse to develop a virtual campaign with the theme of resiliency. 
We have a new logo and website and social media campaign. You can see that on the screen. So that's my story of how Jewish Museum of Florida Jan came to be. And in, in my opinion, it is the greatest example of advocacy and action. You know, when the Jewish community gets behind something, uh, there was advocacy, advocacy initiated at the Jewish Museum of Florida that strengthened throughout the South Florida Jewish community and then spread nationally. Our mission is even more relevant now because during this pandemic, anti-Semitism is again on the rise, especially with the internet attacks and social media, with blame directed at the Jews for the spread of the virus, same as blaming us for the plagues that started back in the 1300s. All through history, Jews have been blamed for every mishap of the world and for the social unrest and economic dislocation that's happening now. So education, education is our strategy. That's the purpose of Jewish American Heritage Month, to educate mostly non-Jews about what we as, Jew, as Jews have contributed to make the world a better place for everyone. Long answer to a short question. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And it is especially important right now, um, given uh, everything that's going on with the COVID crisis. I just wanted to add for um, everyone who's listening that at the Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU. We also, in addition to the concept of resiliency, we wanted to uh, highlight some of the Jewish women in the uh, history of the state of Florida from the different decades, as this is the 100th anniversary of um, the suffrage movement and women's right to vote. So, if you are interested in reading about some of these very fascinating women, um, from the um, from approximately a hundred years ago to now, you can read all about them on our website. So I'll just remind you the name of the website: jmof.fiu.edu. And so there you'll see what we specifically from our museum have contributed to Jewish American Heritage Month for this month. Um, a question came up, and I'm going to ask you now, Marcia, even though we were going to do questions later, but I think it's just very relevant from Ivy, which is uh, if you have a comment on the fact that the Never Again Education Act was just passed. Oh, I think that's tremendous, and that goes along with what we need to do. We need to get Holocaust education into the schools, which Ivy has been doing for, I think, right. 18 years. Mm -hmm. uh, most important, again, to, so we learn the lessons of hatred. It's right. all about trying to extinguish hatred of any, any minorities. Yes, yeah, so I think that was very significant that that happened at this time. Are you ready to start talking a little bit about your book? Would love to. Okay. Here's a slide. So um, as most of you probably know, Marcia has just published a, a brand new and very comprehensive book called Jews of Florida, Centuries of Stories. Um, you, hopefully you can see a copy of it right behind me here. And of course you see the beautiful slide. So I did wanna ask Marcia um, a few questions about how the book came to be. So let's start with this one. What promoted your interest in Florida's Jewish history, and why do you feel preserving Jewish history is so important for future generations, and of course, in the form of a book? Okay, well, how this got started, really, was I moved to Florida in the early 1960s, and my children say, Mom, you ask so many questions. Yes, I've always asked a lot of questions. As a matter of fact, Albert Einstein said, don't stop asking questions. So I've just been one of those people. And I think it's a Jewish thing that we ask a lot of questions. So I arrived in Orlando as a military wife in the early 60s. And I started asking questions. Who were the first Jews here? Uh, how did they get here? Where did they come from? Why did they come? What did they do for a living? How did they interact with the non-Jewish community? What contributions did they make? How did they preserve their traditions? What institutions did they start? I had a lot of questions, but no one had any answers. So that was in my mind from the 60s. And then I got very involved in the Jewish community in Orlando, eventually became president. And I was on the first of the president of the Jewish Federation. And then I was on the first United Jewish Appeal Women's Cabinet in 1974. And we would have retreats 
And at the first question of the retreat was, why are you so involved in the Jewish community? It was asked of each of us. Oh, fuck you. And amazingly to me, most everyone answered <clears throat> that they were involved because someone in their family before them had been involved, a grandmother, a mother, an aunt, someone. And then it hit me, that's the challenge we have in Florida. We don't have that depth of generations like they have in Cleveland and in Chicago and other major Jewish communities. And I realized then in the mid 70s that we had a major challenge in Florida, our Jewish continuity. Meanwhile, I'm very busy, you know, involved in, in many Jewish organizations or to Dasa, my congregation, federation. And then um, we used to have, I used to organize retreats for our federation with uh, notable Jewish scholars. And one was Rabbi Yitz Greenberg, who started the organization Kalal, Center for, Learn Center for Learning and Leadership in New York. And we had several retreats with him. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and he told us at our first retreat that if your memories are Jewish, you will be Jewish. And wow, that really got to me. If your memories are Jewish, you will be Jewish. And then again, I came back to thinking about Florida jewelry. We don't have the depth of memory here because we don't have any history. No one's ever recorded it. It was amazing to me that all the scholars from the Northeastern schools and, and organizations and think tanks had never dealt with Florida seriously as an American Jewish community. Everyone thought that it started, the history started on Miami Beach and, you know, after the, you know, after World War II, when so many soldiers were stationed on the beach and then were enticed to stay and started families there. And that's when they thought the Jewish history of Florida started. So they thought, who cares? It's Condo Commandos, it's Miami Beach. So no one had done any research. And it was like going back to discovering there was no national month for to celebrate what Jews have contributed. I was shocked that no scholars had done any research on this. How could this be? So all the time I'm working, I'm realizing that we need to do something about conserving the history, preserving the, gathering the history to preserve it. No one had gathered the history. So um, I got involved, I didn't start the concept, but Laura Hockman at the SORF JCC in Fort Lauderdale was starting a project to uh, develop an exhibit on where her seniors, she was in charge of senior activities, where her seniors had come from, like in, most in Europe, in Eastern Europe, she was gonna do a little exhibit. So she applied to the Florida Humanities Council for a grant. And at that time, the Florida Humanities Council's theme was making Florida home. Because not just a Jewish issue, generally in Florida, Jews come from somewhere else, I mean, people come from somewhere else, and their allegiances are in their communities from which they came. So even, you know, Jews who die in Florida very often have their bodies shipped north to their home because they never considered Florida home. So Florida the Florida Humanities Council gave this, uh, gave Laura, and at that time she had involved Abe Gittleson, who was the director for education for the Central Agency for Jewish Education in Broward County, and gave them $8,000 to see if they could uh, go around the state and see if there was national, if there was statewide interest in a subject like this. So they came to Orlando, and as I mentioned, I was at that time now a professional for the Jewish Federation. And uh, a friend of mine, Henrietta Katzen, suggested that I go to this meeting and see what it was all about. So I did, and of course, being outspoken and again, asking a lot of questions, they turned to me and said, Marsha, would you help us with this? So I very quickly got involved in the project and became state coordinator of a project that became statewide to research the Jewish history in Florida. And I started an eight year journey around Florida, traveled a quarter of a million miles, set up 30 task forces around the state. I did not do this alone. I had hundreds and hundreds of volunteers. And they helped me un, un, dig out the Jewish history of Florida. It was an eight year process. And that was for the Mosaic Jewish Life in Florida project. Mm -hmm. And throughout this process, I knew I was driven. Obviously I was driven, it was passion of mine to dig out this history to 
preserve it so that Jews, not just the Jews of our generation, but even more importantly, the younger people coming up, but have the pride of knowing what Jews have contributed to the development of Florida. So that's what drove me mm -hmm. to do what I did. Great. So Marcia, do you, if you don't have any more slides, if you take the slides down, everybody could see your face as you're talking. Okay. Or do you have more slides? Well, I just wanted to talk about the, the, the book. The, okay. Uh, yeah, so I just didn't know if you had more slides than the cover of the book. If you have more slides, we'll leave them. Otherwise, I'm sure people would like to see you as you're speaking. <laughs> okay. I do have a few more questions about the book, if I may. But just let me know how many yeah, more well, slides well, you just have. Quickly bring us to the book. I started the Jewish Museum of Florida with a whole right. wonderful group of people in 2019 right. and um, then when I retired in 2011, uh, I really had this need to create something that would outlast me. That would mm -hmm. be, you know, we have exhibits and they're wonderful. We've done many exhibits at the Jewish Museum of Florida. I think when I was there, we did 60 or 70 exhibits and you've carried on beautifully with important exhibits. But exhibits come and go. So I wanted something permanent. So it was always mm -hmm. in the back of my mind that somebody needed to do this. And I guess I was the one that had to do it because I was one that had an information. And I was afraid that I would die before I got this done. So I was really driven to do this. And so uh, my theme is that on the screen, it's all about roots and memory and Jewish continuity. Like cut flowers, Jews wither without our roots. Our collective memories are our roots. So that's the basis of my, that's my motto for having created the museum motto. and creating this book was because we need these collective memories so we are rooted. So our next generation and the generations, all the generations mm -hmm. that follow us will have this rootedness Jewishly in Florida. Thank you so much. So I have another question I'd like to ask you. I know that as you travel around, there are a lot of questions that people ask you, but this one is really specific to our museum. So I'm going to ask you, it's a rather personal question, but I would love for you to have the opportunity to address it. If you could speak a little bit about um, your dear friend, Jonathan Simons, and how he was able to help you with this book and what that means to you. Well, first of all, Jonathan, can you see me now? Not yet. Oh, really? I don't know what, that, I took off the slides. Marcia, do you want to stop sharing your screen? I'll go ahead and take care of it. Uh, I think that it's, it says resume share, so it must not be. Uh, this will stop. Okay, I think. No, it's it. Yeah, you need to stop sharing on your end. Okay, that's better. There you go. There we go. Good. Perfect. Okay. Okay. Okay, Jonathan. Jonathan Simons, who unfortunately passed away suddenly uh, in mm -hmm. early December in London. Um, he was a very unique individual. He had, uh, he and I were soulmates. He saw, when, for, when he first visited the museum, he saw what I needed to do, what I was trying to do, what I had done, and he was totally supportive. Uh, even though he lived in London and had an apartment that his father had gotten in Miami Beach like 1975, and he came periodically for holidays, um, he had a very close relationship with Rabbi Gary Glickstein at, uh, Best Shalom, and he always wanted to be here for the holidays, but his primary home was London. And people thought it was really strange that all of a sudden we have this major donor at the museum who was from London. He didn't even live in Florida as a permanent residence. But he, uh, as I say, he, he had this, this neshuma, this, this good soul that he supported important Jewish things for the same reasons that I felt for Jewish continuity. He totally understood that. So he became our most major private donor to the Jewish Museum of Florida. I gave well over a million dollars over time. He named the second building as uh, people see the name Jonathan Simons, named it these in memories of his family, his mother and grandmother. And um, he knew, he understood everything that I asked him to do, he understood right away uh, when I needed special projects. So when the book came up, uh, I had to have a sponsor for the book. I thought, you know, I didn't know, I, I'd never done book publishing before. I didn't know when you go to a publisher, especially for a book like this, that's supposedly a risk for them because it's a very niche book. 
it's Florida Jewish history. It's not a national appeal. And it's a very expensive book. It's 434 pages, 716 photographs. I always say it's, it's twice as big as the Torah because the Torah has 305,000 characters and my book has over 700,000 characters. Characters mean letters in the words. So it's a big book and, it's an ex and I wanted a hard cover. <laughs> so uh, Jonathan right away said, I'll be your sponsor for the book. And he did become a sponsor for my book. So he's, he's, he's permanently with me. Uh, I think of him every hour of every day because he was a special, special, special friend to the museum and to me personally. And I miss him. I'm sure you we do, talk, and that's why. We talk all the time. We talk about all the matters of the world. I know. Well, that's why I wanted to give you an opportunity to thank you to speak about him. And then I wanted to tell you something else that I haven't told you happened yet, but it's about the book and something that you highlighted in the book. It's um, a sad, a sad story, but an important story, and that is that you told the story in the book about Stephen Sotloff who was a captive of ISIS and um, was unfortunately beheaded. We had a program honoring him with his parents and you were kind enough to sign a book for them. And during the program, I presented it to them and they were so very grateful. And I just want you to know that it's a very meaningful, um, you were, I think one of the first or only people to actually put that into a book. Well, oh. that was one of my most challenging things, too. You know, people ask me, sometimes ask me, what's the most challenging thing that mm -hmm. you had with the book? And the, most of the photographs, about 85% of the photographs in my book, I mentioned there were 716, came from our collections, the, thing, the collections that we had gathered during my collections for Mosaic that became the Jewish Museum of Florida collections. So 85% of my pictures came from the little over 600. So 110 of them I had to get original and you can't go to the internet to get them because the resolution is too mm. low. So it has to be, you know, the original photographs. And for Stephen Sotloff, who was to me, I wanted to dedicate my media section to him because he was a very important uh, young man who was, came from Miami. He was a grandson of Holocaust survivors. He had gone to University of Central Florida in Orlando to take journalism. He then he went to Israel and Arab countries to learn how to speak Arabic and Hebrew. And he became a journalist. He wanted to tell the stories uh, from the from the participants, the people who lived in the Middle East, he wanted to tell it from their point of view, not from what the news out. He wanted to tell it from the inside out. And uh, he traveled to very dangerous places in Arab countries. And that's how he got um, captured by the Taliban. And uh, yes, as you mentioned, he was horribly beheaded on national TV, international TV in 2014. So I wanted to tell the story of this very brave, sad, sad story of, this, of Stephen Sotloff. So I contacted his family. I contacted Carol Brick Turin at the Jewish Federation because they have a um, foundation that I think supports journalists coming up from the Jewish Federation in his name. And all they sent me were pictures of him as a tourist standing at the pyramids with a, you know, a head garb on, was staring with Arabs. And I wanted something that showed what he did. That's in my book, I wanted every picture to have a, a reason to show, not, I didn't, you know, it's like always with exhibits, didn't want to use headshots. I wanted to show people what they do. Mm -hmm. So it took me almost a year to find the picture that I wanted. And I would just ask everybody. I had a friend that worked for uh, Getty. I had a picture, I had friends that worked for different news resources and getting photographs. And one of them finally led me to a journalist in England who said that he, he had spoken to Stephen Sotloff on the phone, but he had never met him. They were supposed to meet in Jerusalem at one point and their signals got switched and they didn't meet. But he thought that he would be able to find the picture that I wanted. So he, Abel, actually led that to me. I even called the Museum of the News in Washington mm. during the uh, time, the sequestering, when they, it was when the government was shut down in December, I think, of 2018. And uh, even the curator from there called me back and said, the only pictures we have are the ones that you're talking about of him as a tourist. That's what the family gave us. So I was able to get the picture that you see in the book of him actually interviewing Libyans and with his, you, you, you have to look in the book to see the picture. It's a great picture. It is, and it was very meaningful to the family. Uh, I bet they hadn't even seen that picture, had they? Yeah, 
No, and it was very meaningful to them that we had the program and an exhibit about him at, at the museum, but also that you had put him, him in the books. So um, that was one of the things I wanted to make sure to, to mention to you about the book. Um, here's my next question. We do have the book at the museum, but we're not open yet. There it is. Somebody's holding up the picture, Nancy. Nancy's holding up the picture. Someone else is holding up the, the book itself. Can you see it, Marsha? I don't know how many people can see that, Nancy, but yes, we're looking oh, at Oh, yeah, the that's picture. the picture, yeah. 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 A, yeah. yeah. He's interviewing the Olivians. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. So um, uh, we do have copies of the book at the museum, but you know, due to the pandemic, we're not open yet. So how could some of the people who are here today who might like the book now before we reopen, how could they get the book? Can they contact oh, you directly? Uh, contact me, M Zerevitz, M-Z-E-R-I-V-I-T-Z -E -I -I at me, M-E dot com. Terrific. Okay. I'm glad to send it out. I have a supply here. Okay, and I'm just going to remind everyone of our website because we have a few virtual reality tours on there that you could look at as well as all of the information about, about Jewish American Heritage Month. So that's J-M-O-F dot F-I-U dot E-D-U. So Marsha, at this point, a number of people have typed in questions and Nancy has been um, collating them and, and putting them together for you. So I'm going to turn the program over for a minute at this point to Nancy so she can um, ask you the questions. Are you ready? Hi, Marcia. Marcia, are you ready for the questions? I am. There okay. are a of comments that we have on the chat, but I also want to add that if um, we, we do have a link on our website to purchase Marcia's book uh, also, um, which is, includes a donation to the museum. If you go to our website, um, you can purchase it that way. And when we get back in, and hopefully in a few weeks or a month or so, we'll be able to mail those out. So they can go to, there's a link on the, right at the top of our, of our homepage um, all about um, Marsha's book. So I want to remind people of that. So let me go to the questions. So um, I don't know if you mentioned this, but when was the word history changed to heritage? on the Jewish American Heritage Month. We go Florida Jewish history, we do American Jewish heritage. That was back in when, uh, with uh, the president's office. So, and then someone asked, um, someone asked, um, just how do we get this information out to schools around the country, libraries? Um, what's, what, I know you've been traveling around Florida, talk, doing these book tours. Um, how is that going for you? Well, the book tours were great. I did a 15-city tour, and of course, it was abruptly ended with uh, COVID-19. But now I'm doing them on Zoom. So uh, I've, I've had to learn that new technology. It's been a bit challenging. But I have my first one May 31st for the uh, for Congregation B'nai Tour in Ormond Beach. And they will invite their, their congregation to join, and I'll be doing them on Zoom. Uh, Sarah Levitin, who was a good friend of the museum, wants to know why the History of Miami never talks about American Jewish Heritage Month. She says they talk about Haitian History Month. Um, she suggested it. Any, any suggestions from you on how we can get History of Miami to include this in there, in, or I guess in Miami? Well, I couldn't answer, but then you'd have to talk, talk to George Zamanello and, and ask him. He, he knows me, and I would certainly provide any information. Right. And I know you, the museum would too. Yeah, That's yeah. the biggest challenge we have in getting the other organizations, the other museums, the other national organizations to adopt these programs and get the word out. The curriculums that we used to do for, uh, oh, that's another thing I should mention, very important. Uh, of course, everything, but there's not even any schools now, so it's uh, in person. So with the book, uh, again, uh, I wanted to do, we, did a, we do a curriculum, every year that I was at the museum, we did a curriculum for Florida Jewish History Month with a different theme every year. We did it with the school board. They wrote it with our material. They put their name on it and they distributed it. So for my book, I thought, oh my God, we got to get this back into the schools. So I contacted uh, the social studies department, actually through Michael, for, through Martin Karp. Martin Karp is really the, was the one that made this happen. Uh, he contacted the right people, the social studies department of Miami-Dade schools. And they said they would be happy to do a curriculum of a book, but now it costs $12,000. Well, it used to be no charge to do the curriculums. But now with everybody's budgets being tight. So uh, again, I went back to Jonathan and I went to Russell Galbett 
And those two gentlemen, um, Russell with his family, with Ronna Lee and the Family Foundation, uh, co-sponsored with Jonathan the curriculum for the Miami-Dade County Schools. So it was distributed, we, we worked through the summer and it turned out great. And it was distributed to over 3,000 teachers in middle and high school for language arts and social studies uh, in December uh, to get ready for January and uh, when my book was being released. And uh, then shortly thereafter, uh, it, it got distributed, but then of course everything came to a halt. So I would like to hopefully when the schools resume, uh, their curriculums are very limited now because it's all remote. I would like to be able to get that into all 67 counties. And the same thing should be done on a national level. The national level, to be really honest with you, and I, I'm always very upfront, we have had challenges with funding. I mentioned that we ran a national membership campaign. It was not successful. Uh, we've always had capital capitalization uh, challenges, underfunded. So of course, to any movement, and it requires money. You have to hire teachers to do the, yeah. the curriculum. So. With funding, yes, this should be a national curriculum. It should be in every library. It should be in every school. It should be everywhere. But it all depends on funding. Susan? Are there any more questions, Nancy? Yeah, there, there's some, some other um, comments that people have made. Um, I guess it's probably more directed specifically to Marsha. She can review those. But no, no real questions, just some comments. Um, I, I thought Marsha could mention um, we had uh, from Jean Soman, who's who's sort of sponsoring to send some books around the around the oh, yes. uh, state. So that was a nice gesture as well. It should it, it goes along with what Marsha's saying. Oh, that's a great project. Jean Soman is so responsive. And Jean Soman, I've mentioned in the book, her great grandfather was a, a photographer of Lincoln. So it's amazing, uh, you know, in my book, we cover from Moses Levy, who was the first developer in Florida back in 1819. We go to Lincoln and his contacts with Jews and Lansky, I said the L's, the Levy, Lincoln and Lansky. There's so many great stories, but Jean's, um, Jean Soman has hugely su supported our museum, American Jewish Archives in Cincinnati, which I work closely with. And she called me a few weeks ago and she said, you know, this book is so great. It needs to get into all the Jewish libraries and museums. So uh, she said she was going to purchase them from the museum. Then I should come up with a list. Well, fortunately, I spoke for the American Jewish Librarians uh, International Museum a, a, a conference, even though it's called American, they have international uh, delegates to their international conference a couple of years ago, I spoke to them about the Jewish history in Florida. So I became familiar with uh, one of the major people that works with the American Jewish librarians. He's the, he's been the head of Judaic studies at the University of Michigan, where I happen to go. Um, he just retired, his name is Elliot Gertel. So, you know, over the years, and like all of you that have been involved in Jewish community work or community work, you have this network of people. So immediately I called Elliot Gertel, he was American Jewish Library, so I said, I need to create a list of places that would be designated to receive my book to get into their libraries. He said, well, don't just send it out because some, some places won't even put it into their libraries. They'll just keep them personally or they'll just discard it. You need to contact each one to see which one will put it into the collections and actually make it accessible to the public. So that's what I'm in the process of doing. He and I created a list together of all the Jewish libraries in the country and in Canada. And I'm now in the process, I've been, I've sent out all the emails and I'm now getting responses back. And what was so exciting, I got a response back from Harvard. We already have the book in our library. I got a book, I got a response from Berkeley in California. We already have the book in the library. So that was very exciting. So now I'm getting a list of who still needs the book. And uh, that will go, those that names, the names will be submitted to the museum and they will send the book out, as Nancy's told me, as soon as the museum opens um, and get, can get the access to the book. So that's we'll also, very important. Yes, we're also going to be sending books courtesy of uh, Ken Bloom to all of the local um, synagogues and congregations. In, in Wonderful, the, uh, I didn't even know yeah. that. That's great. But we have, we, we can't do it until we reopen. Right. Uh, on a sort of a final question and then I have just one or two comments. If there's one primary message that you would like people to take away from your book, not one specific story but an actual message, I suppose it's the the about the roots, but is there any other thing that you would say that you hope that people who read your book come away 
feeling or knowing or comprehending? Well, I'm hoping the book will add joy and meaning to everyone's life because they're going to gain so much new knowledge. I think that everyone on this call is like myself. I like to learn something every day and then I feel like I've accomplished something. So you will learn a tremendous amount. You'll be able to share with your friends. In fact, read the, the uh, forward by Mark Tallis. It is just, that's another very poignant thing. Mark Talisman, who many of you I'm sure know, he was the a major Jewish community personality. Uh, he started the, um, the office, Washington Action Office for all the Jewish federations. He was vice chair with Elie Wiesel to starting the Holocaust Museum in Washington. He was Mr. Jewish for those of us that were Jewish leaders in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. And he's been my friend uh, always. And uh, when I told him about my book, he said, I want to write, oh, I, I said I needed 60 words. To, I was asked by my publisher to get quotes from Jewish, from, from uh, celebrity kind of people for the front of the book. You know how people always write, you know, you should read this book because, and it was 60 words. So this was really funny. So I wrote Mark Talisman and I said, uh, I need 60 words. So he said, I want to read the book first. And so I sent him the book, you know, on the email, and he was astounded because he's old school. He's expected to find, get a box in the mail with the paper printed. So he read the entire book, and he wrote a 2,000-word essay when it was supposed to be 60 words. And I called him. I said, Mark, you were supposed to write 60 words. What am I going to do with this? He said, do with it what you want. So I shared it with a friend of mine, Rachel Heimovix, who was, used to be an editor for Harcourt Grace Jovanovich. And she's my editor. And um, she said, this is a forward. So I wrote, I called Mark up and I said, okay, if we use it as a forward. He said, great. Well, in the forward, he tells you why you need to read the book. And he's, he tells you, you're going to want to share the stories with friends. And that's what I'm hoping you will do. I'm hoping, unfortunately, I have to finish with Mark passed away suddenly the summer. I mean, it was just horrible. These two major people in my life that were connected to me and my book, Mark Talisman and Jonathan Simons, both suddenly passed away before the book became a reality, before it was released. But I'm hoping that people will take this learning and have a great sense of pride in what Jews have accomplished, you know, the story of immigration, acculturation, achievement, and most importantly, please, 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 get it into the hands, as I said earlier, of young people. Because our generation, it's great that we know this, but we're gonna be gone. We need to have the, our grandchildren read these books, to read this book and learn and have the pride. And so it's the Jewish continuity issue that I'm most passionate about. And the fact that we use this education as a weapon against anti-Semitism. Share it with your non-Jewish friends. Little tidbits that you learn. Did you know? I mean, to me, this is very important. And this is what Jewish American Heritage Month is about. This is what my book is about as a weapon against anti-Semitism. All great. the Jews have accomplished. Yeah. That's great. Thank you. To improve want... the quality of life for everyone. That's you know, yeah. very important. Okay. So I just want to say something on a personal note, which is I'm very honored to be mentioned in your book. And I'm also thrilled that you mentioned my father, Rabbi Joseph Narrett. So on a personal note in my family, we're very, very honored to be in the book. I have had a question about um, people being able to get the recording. Nancy, is that something we can post on the website? Uh, yes, I believe we can. It's, I can, I'll send Mark, I'll put it up there as soon as we can uh, get it posted. Okay. So we're, so we're going to post this on our website. I'll say it again, jmof.fiu.edu. And as has been suggested by Michael Orvitz, if you, or um, get a whole, you know, get the recording, you can share it with all of your networks. And in this way, that many more people will be able to hear what Marcia had to say today. Susan, it when we get it up there, it'll be linked through the uh, American Jewish Heritage tab at the top of the page. Okay, Did everybody hear that? Through the American Jewish Heritage Month tab. And, and I would uh, like to say something before we close. I would like to I was just ask you, do you have any closing remarks? Well, I want to thank Nancy and Susan for the fabulous job they're doing. I'm so proud that my baby is in such good <laughs> hands because I feel very confident that the Jewish Museum of Florida will flourish and grow and become even more important, especially in these times when it's just such a social crisis and educational crisis and 
in everyone's lives all over the world. But to start with the Jewish Museum of Florida and reach out to so many people as you're doing with your Zoom exhibits. And I'm just so proud to know that you were, you're accomplishing so much. Thank you. Thank you. You know, for the, just I'm going to mention to all of you who are on here, we have a virtual reality uh, exhibit of our Judith Bieber exhibit. It's in virtual reality form. And then we're doing it on Zoom calls, much like Marsha did her uh, slides. We do the virtual reality call on a Zoom. And we did it for the Lions of Judah of Miami. And they loved it so much that they've been calling all of their Lions of Judah friends around the country. I said we sound like a, a, a train, a railroad train where we're going, but we've been in Palm Beach, we're going to Sarasota, Atlanta, Baltimore, Buffalo, Kansas City, Winnipeg. Um, we just got Las Vegas. And, and so Western, Western Massachusetts. Western Massachusetts. So um, if you haven't, and also we're conducting them for locally. Um, Nancy puts that in the newsletter. Every few weeks we do one just for our membership. So please join us for one of those. Susan? And uh, Howard Brer is here. I'm going to mention Howard. Howard is going to do one of his walking tours, and you can join that as well. So we're doing lots of things during the time that we are not open, but we are certainly active. So thank you so much to all of you for joining us today. And a very special thank you to you, Marcia, for coming on and speaking with me. Ta and the rest of the group. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Is there an opportunity to ask one more question? Yes, go ahead. I'm sorry. Marcia, this is Mike Weinroth from Atlanta. Hi. How are you? Okay, great. Congratulations. Okay, I want to ask a question. The question is how, after your efforts to create a month recognizing American Jewish heritage, how is that going to be embraced from state to state so it's really a federal mandated thing? You went through Congress, it was passed by and signed off by President Bush. But my question is, much like uh, African American month in February, which is celebrated far and wide throughout the country, how are we gonna be assured that American Heritage Month will be like that? Thank you for the question. And it's great to see you, Mike. Thank you. Because from Orlando, we have great connections there. Um, that's a very good, important question. And it's a challenge. We started this in 2006. And as I mentioned earlier, it's been a challenge with funding. Uh, it is a congressional resolution. It is distributed nationally every year. It's a presidential proclamation every year, including this year. Uh, so it's a matter of people. My, uh, my dream when I started this was to have a representative in each of the 50 states, which would have task forces that would get this message out into each state to the appropriate people. That has not happened. We had a national administrator for a short while and we ran out of money and now we don't have a national administrator. Right now we're in a very challenging position with uh, our national month. But it, it is a national month that does exist. This J News has sent these press releases and materials went out to everybody all over the country. So hopefully it's being enacted. We can't have public programs this year. That's the biggest challenge. Usually we have you know, public programs that go on in hundreds and hundreds of communities throughout the, the nation. But this year, hopefully people are doing Zoom like Susan had the wise idea to do this on Zoom. And I appreciate that and I'm hoping that other froze for a right. minute for georgia I, yes i can tell you that that through the j muse um project there are at least 50 other jewish museums and institutions actively participating not only doing programs like this but also doing what we're doing on our website which is every week highlighting um an aspect of an important and this year women uh, unfortunately we've reached the limit of our time um, Marcia's given you her email, so please feel, I'm sure you won't mind, Marcia, if people email you any other questions. Oh, please do. And, and, and mzarabitz at me.com. If you want the book right now, I can send it out today. Right. Or if anybody has any other questions for you, they could email them to you, correct? Absolutely. I'd love it. I love okay. questions. So once again, let me thank you so much for joining me and joining all of our guests.
been a pleasure and uh, everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye, everybody. Thank you.